All right, we, due to some very strange technical difficulties, have had to do this podcast just for today. A little bit different. Hopefully, we can rectify it for future issues. But I'm here today just for a lovely a catch-up conversation with my dad, who's been kind enough to join the podcast today. Nick Walsh, thank you so much uh, for being with us. Um, and we... Due to the fact that we don't have, you know, the introduction where I normally go through all the stories, I'm I'm thinking today, why don't we just get into it? Um, and we are starting today with you may be able to tell by the title, we have Washington in Washington, Joe Biden on Tuesday unveiling plans to enact significant restrictions on migrants seeking asylum at the US Mexico border as the White House tries to neutralize immigration as a political liability ahead of the November elections. Um, so pretty much what he is doing here is doing a lot of the essentially executive order parts that, and it really is such a bad look on so many levels because we talked about this bill uh, back when it was uh, back in bill form a few at the time. It's just a flat circle now. So it was, it was like maybe a month or two ago in the house, the Senate passed it and it was essentially an overhaul on asylum, which made it much, much harder for migrants to declare asylum, really playing into what Trump wanted to do with that and using some of the same policies and some of the same parts of the law that he used. And Trump essentially came out when that was in bill form, vetoed it and or essentially came out against it and it was essentially served as a veto because Mike Johnson and all the rest of the House Republicans, despite saying, oh, we want tough immigration reform for years and years and years. And Biden's big, you know, just loves open borders and loves, you know, cartels and all that. Um, they essentially took what the best chance they could have had at a, at a good border deal, passed it away. And their argument was, well, you know, Joe Biden doesn't need to pass laws. He could just do this by executive order anyway. So a few months later, what does he do? He passes essentially the same thing uh, by by executive order, essentially proving the Republicans' point. So, And this was supposed to be a move that was savvy politically. I just do not get it. Uh, the long-time anticipated pr uh, presidential proclamation would bar migrants from being granted asylum when U.S. officials deem the southern border is overwhelmed. That point has happened, you know, the the I think was they said it was like four or 5,000 interactions a week, and that is happening in a day uh, on the border at the moment. The Democratic president has contemplated unilateral action for months after the collapse of a bipartisan security deal in Congress that most Republican lawmakers rejected at the behest of former President Donald Trump, the presumptive GOP nominee. So I, what I really don't get here is beyond all the cruelty and the insanity of Biden just being so hypocritical on this, which was really one of his big issues that he kind of ran on. I don't even think it is a politically smart move either. I'm very curious uh, to get your reaction to this. Well, I think two things. One, what choice did he have, really? The border's a bipartisan issue. There's too many migrants coming across in, in an unchecked manner, and he had to do something about it. And you can say with hand on your heart that this is not the best thing to do, but he had to do something. I mean, again, that's that's another thing where I do kind of disagree with you. Like, this is something that he played into unnecessarily at every step of the turn. I feel like he could have taken the essentially win, especially after he took the positions that he took in the 26, 20, 20 election, where he was talking about, oh, Donald Trump is trying to destroy our asylum system. We want to be different than Donald Trump. He said one of the big things that got him to run was the cruelty of Trump's immigration policy. Uh, and then he just goes and adopts it the moment he you know, perceives to have a little bit of political pressure. But Again, this bill was dead in the water. This is something that he clearly wants to do. And again, there's not people who are, you know, Biden voters or even would be Biden voters who are really pissed off, really upset about Biden. I just don't see that anywhere, even politically, like where he had to do this. And also, he's essentially proving their point, Republicans point, uh, when they said, oh, you know, you have to pass it with you could you could just pass this with executive order. You should have done this a long time ago. You don't need to well, sign don't this you think the and he's messaging, like, okay. Don't you think the messaging back is going to be 
Republicans, you guys screwed this up. We had a bipartisan deal. Now I'm going to do this on my own because I want to fix the border and you guys don't. I mean, the spin doctors are going to have their way with this, right? So they're going to say, this is Biden being tough on the border, fixing the border. And certain people are going to say, no, it's not. And lost in this whole thing is the fact that all the immigration has kept inflation down. <laughs> so, you know, it's been a positive, to be honest. But yeah. That's not how so go, well. go into that for a little more. Just is just why would you say that inflation has kept or immigration has kept inflation down? Well, normally you can't have a three and a half to four percent unemployment rate for very long without inflation taking up wage inflation, that is in particular, which is you know the biggest part of it. And the we have had that because, and the best economists have pick their finger on the fact that there's been, you know, a one to 2% increase in the labor pool, which is based on immigration, you know? Um, and that has helped keep labor costs down, helped keep inflation down and, helped and that's a, keep yeah. interest rates down. Of course. Yeah. That's, a, that's a very interesting point there with the price and the, you know, just the expansion of immigrant labor into the labor pool, also way more productivity. And that's something that we've relied on as America, like all throughout our society, time and time again, also for immigrants to be paid the lowest wages. And I think if there's some type of reform that needs to be made to the immigration system is, or, you know, to the, yeah, just the immigration system and the labor system is to make sure that these people get put, you know, treated at least semi more fairly than they do now because at this point it's just like you know they are keeping the the only way a lot of some of the you know the construction some of the farming gets done in the south is through vastly vastly underpaid immigrant labor and if that were ever to change i think we'd have like real problems as we saw for a little bit when desantis i think tried to kick all the immigrants out of florida there was just nothing you know being done so it, yeah it's a big it's a big thing and then i think the important thing that you said there the thing, the important thing that you said there, and I think you know, we can get into a different thing with, uh, you know, some of the wage inflation. It is, de it's definitely not been, and I think some of the top economists have have said that a lot of this is greed, inflation, corporate price gouging, taking advantage of the situation, of in a kind of inflationary attitude to just raise prices up uh, in a very, very apparent way. And it's the, it's a theory that's been becoming more and more mainstream. But you know, that could also be true. Well, I think, you know, you have the situation with the the immigration coming down. And what I want to know is why is Biden so weak that he has to make that argument? He has to make Trump's argument for him instead of making the argument that you just made right there. I don't think he thinks that argument has any legs, really, you know, with the middle class America that says actually immigration is sort of helping us. And well you know, I don't think he thinks that it'll be that popular. Yeah. Do you I I think I think he's I think he is wrong for that. I really do. Because I think mm -hmm. inflation Maybe. is such a big thing for a lot of people that they care about. And again, it's like the reason why so much anti immigrant sentiment is is popping off it is 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 entrenching itself and normalizing itself into american society is because there is no counter argument being made to trump essentially you have you know people like al sharpton this was a really amazing moment for me to see people like al sharpton coming in characterizing migrants coming into big cities as an invasion you know using the same rhetoric that on the same exact channel of MSNBC they would have castrated Donald Trump for using towards and they right. pro they definitely have castrated Donald Trump for using towards uh immigrants in the past it just it's it is an absolute another example to me of just the really you know lack of morals and lack of perception uh here from any of the democratic party I'll assume you mean castigated as opposed to castrated, but the maybe I'm wrong on that. But um, it could be a little bit of both. I don't know. <laughs> but the bottom line, of course, is you know when immigrants come, 
certain people welcome them and put them to work and help them assimilate and certain people um, want to kick them out. And it's been that way in our country for since its founding. And, you know, we quibble over the exact amount of immigrants that are appropriate. And I may say a million and a half a year, you may say 3 million a year, but the bottom line is we do need immigrants. And, you know, we can just fight over how many they should be. In my opinion, the more inflationary activity is the fiscal spending and all of the things that have gone on with the government spending so much money. That's been much more inflationary. And, you know, the migrant labor has helped. But if Biden doesn't win, you know, I think inflation is going to be on the short list of reasons why, and his fiscal stimulus plans are going to be, you know, the match that lights the inflationary fuse. Um, so I don't know. Do you, again, do you see it differently? This is something. This is something that I didn't even have in the plans to talk about, but it's a very interesting, and I think it's an important thing to talk about because I just I have seen that. You know, the, the Larry Summers of 2021 kind of mindset of, you know, inflation is going to have to go up, you know, unemployment's going to have to go up because Biden did this really irresponsible fiscal package. Like, I feel like that is just completely been blown out of the water at this point because the fiscal package is one of, you know, especially with the things with the child tax credit, um, you know, some of the uh, environmental spending, some of the COVID relief spending that really helped people. I think that's also one of the reasons why we rebounded from COVID probably the best you know, when COVID, not, you know, handled COVID the best, but when COVID was all said and done, our economic recovery was one of the best, in the, if not the best in the developed world. And I think it was because we were able to, you know, transfer that money and people did put it in a big way, you know, back into the economy. But also, if you look at inflation has come down because, you know, this was never going to be, you know, this kind of, you have the migrant labor aspect, but you also have people just, you know, naturally spending more, you know, and things going back to normal when, First, you have, oh, you get this, you know, inflationary rise, but uh, from some of the spending, but also you have a large part of that is coming from gas, and it's coming from food, and it's coming from rent. And we've seen, you know, Saudi Arabia having having their way with that. I think that's a big part. But we've also seen U.S. collaborators, there's allegations of U.S. collaborators coming in with OPEC to manipulate oil prices. There's... You know, the FBI just raided a bunch of corporate landlords for using an algorithm to stabilize prices. Um, and you also have, you know, I think there was a big case about, you know, pr price fixing with, I think, eggs or some kind of very essential food product as well. That's not coming to the top of my mind, but I encourage people to go look it up. Like, it is a very, you know, that is a big part of it. And I'll, excuse me, it's also where people feel the most pain as well which is the, you know, those three parts of inflation, that's where they notice it the most. I don't have the numbers on the top of my head in terms of but rental you, you, consolidation over the course of the country, but. Well, I know a, at the FBI very, rating you is a pretty big deal. I would right, say. But a definite symptom of the housing crisis is a lot of big private equity companies bought up a lot of rental properties around the yeah. country in buckets of 10s and 20s and 30s and cornered markets in many, many markets. And they are managing these. They've since gone public and they've really, I would expect that to be ground zero for the backlash against these guys because they just have jack rents, you know, without reference to the, to the local market, you know, and it's really been a, been a problem. But yeah, I sorry, go ahead. Continue. No, I, I totally just wanted to emphasize that point. I think in housing, government regulation is going to come down pretty hard, I would say. Yeah, well, if the government's functioning, functioning well, uh, which is always a big if. Uh, so, yeah, the, then also the, the green inflation thing has just been a massive, massive undercurrent of the entire Biden administration. And also something that. You know, Biden, he has talked about it. He's mentioned it. He's already mentioned it a little bit more now. But in terms of concrete policy action, he is A, not doing enough, and B, not effectively mentioning the things that he did. If I were him 
and I know as a big Wall Street Journal person or reader, subscriber, you may not be a fan of this, but I would be putting, you know, Lena Khan up on every major TV show as a representative, like, oh, here's how I'm fighting for you. Because, you know, if for me, that's one of the things, Lena Khan's presence, that's one of the things that, you know, barring a lot of other stuff that's happened since then, would really incentivize me to, to vote for Biden, you know? Well, along those lines, I think there are certain industries where consolidation has eliminated competition. And in that case, they should get on their horse. But like to go up against, you know, a merger of high end retailers because they've cornered the market on aspirational handbags seems just like folly. But to go up against, Apple because Apple won't let me text with an Amazon with a with an Android person. Uh, I think that is a hundred percent worth their time. You know what I mean? Like it feels yeah. like they just have have to pick their battles better. But yeah, there are I, battles out there. I don't disagree. I feel like I feel like the U.S. government should be. Maybe they're, they're not totally, but I think they definitely should be uh, capable of doing a bit of both. Uh, but either way, we do have to move on to the way that Republicans are hurting themselves politically. And that is in the contraception and abortion department. Senate Republicans on Wednesday blocked action on legislation to codify the right to contraception access nationwide. A bill brought to the floor to spotlight an issue on which the GOP is at odds with a vast majority of voters. All but two Republicans present voted against advancing the legislation, and those were not surprised. Uh, Lisa Murkowski and Susan Collins, uh, Democrats unanimously supported it, were left nine votes short of the 60 they would need to take up the bill, which, again, is still so insane. And by the way, that's something that you know circles back to Biden and his refusal to get rid of the filibuster, uh, which would protect a reproductive health option that many voters worry is actively at risk of being stripped away. And again, this is something that he could put into law and we could look back, you know, years and years down the road and say, well, maybe not too many years down the road and say, oh, wasn't it nice when we still had the chance to codify contraception into law? But we, you know, and of course the law could always, you know, that that won't stop them, but it would it would definitely help. But I do also think, you know, this is another really a smart political move and really some of the Democrats should be focusing on more to emphasize just how crazy and how at odds a lot of people are. This is, this is like a, I don't, I don't know what the Democrats number is right now in the Senate. It was like a Republicans number. I think it feels like 50 votes counting or not counting uh, Lisa Murkowski and Susan Collins. This is like 50 votes for a policy that maybe five to 10% of Americans support it is really a shocking choice for a political party to make here i mean 100 percent. i i think they're just gonna cut their own knees out but you know even in on the abortion front when you look at all the red states that have codified abortion into their state constitutions you can't imagine i mean i can't imagine that they're gonna be receptive to a contraception ban given that they've just enshrined abortion into their rights you know well yeah as a as a constitutional expert knows the thing is that you the you have the federal law preceding the the state law so even if this does you know i don't i doubt republicans would would pass it but i think it's very very interesting that they are choosing to you know give the and they know what the democrats are trying to do when they do this um and they are still choosing because of the power of not even their whole base, but that very vocal minority of their base that was essentially the key key winning block for Trump in the past. Um, they are so so focused on on capitulating to that. I think that is that is a very very remarkable thing. And I think do you, do you think that's you know from my perspective, I think I don't know about you. I feel like that's got to be their only saving grace. Uh, the Democrats, one of their few saving graces. They have other than just the you know the nature of Trump himself in this upcoming election is you know look at the entire Republican caucus bar two 
who are barely even Republicans and everyone knows it, just agreed to take away your access to contraception. Yeah, I I I think their folly knows no no bounds on that front in terms of Republicans doing that. I, it's 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 quite surprising. I I don't think it'll ever be enshrined anywhere. To be honest, but you know, maybe they just need like a what's the right term like a message vote or just like a show me vote if I'm in a yeah you know yeah. deeper blue district to to you know or deeper red district to say hey I'm I'm against abortion or contraception you know. Yeah, and I do I do think the Democrats are going to, you know, use it as that. And that's going to be another one of the things to because it is when you're looking at this election, it is very, very hard to balance out all, you know, the different factors of just the extreme nature of the Republican Party, the unpopular nature of Joe Biden and essentially, you know, come weighing those two in the various areas. But this, I would say, is a major, major boon to uh, people, you know, just the same way they did in 2022 viewing the Republicans as an extreme party, a party that is now, you know, not the one that is conserving social norms and conserving the way things used to be, but it is actively taking us backwards. You know, like that is, I think that is a big thing that really changed for a lot of people in 2022. It's kind of the psychology behind a lot of the, the Dobbs vote, because it's just like, whoa, like we were used to this stuff. You know, 1973 was a pretty long time ago for abortion and, you know, contraception, I believe, was before that even um, in terms of in terms of ruling. So that is a major, major step for them to, you know, try and take away. And this is only uh, adding to it. And if I were the Democrats, I would be talking about this every day of the week. Fair enough. I agree. All right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I also did want to really get your reaction on this one. This was a policy that I was pretty excited about was the New York City putting in and voting for and all that. Um, This was something that was passed through by the legislature, all ready to go, signed into law actually by Andrew Cuomo. And they were setting up for it for the last few years. It was about to start, I believe, on June 30th, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, maybe even a little bit earlier. But Kathy Hochul said today that she will indefinitely pause the plan to charge drivers higher prices for driving in essentially the area south of Central Park to the southern tip of Manhattan. Uh, And apparently, this is the kind of the new piece of information here. Uh, Kathy Hochul received $36,000 from lobbyists for state automobile dealers. Half that money came from a lobbying group that opposed congestion pricing, setting consequences for dealers and thousands of people they employ. As recently as two weeks ago, Hochul told real leaders at the Global Economic Summit that investing in uh, public transit policies uh, you know, through things like congestion pricing is what cities are meant to do. But on Wednesday... Hochul declared traffic reform was not in the best interest of New Yorkers. After careful consideration, she said, I have come to a difficult decision that implementing the plan congestion pricing risks too many unintended consequences for New Yorkers at this time. She said in a news conference, which, by the way, there was no press even in the room at the time, which is very, very telling. uh, On June 5th, this was today. For that reason, I've directed the MTA to indefinitely pause the program. So, again, it would have been a. $15 $15 toll for passenger cars. Uh, this is just months after she took $30,000. I believe this would have been, because what is it? It just it just turned, the second quarter just ended, so there would be these FEC filings coming through, and that's how this, it must have been $36,000. They were really turning on the heat uh, for Kathy Hochul, which, again, it may not seem like a lot, but it, it does ring very similar to... Um, Andrew Cuomo and what he did with the nursing home after receiving all that money from the nursing home lobby. Uh, mm-hmm. So what is your reaction to this? The policy, the taking the money, the whole thing. I guess if she took the money legally, you really can't fault her. You can fault the system, right? Yeah. I mean, and I think then... you, can fault, you can fault both pretty easily, you know, and you could get her out of there if you had an effective political, you know, control over the Democratic Party, which is Hopefully, what right, right, left wingers, you know, to 
staunch the flow of lobbyist money is a very difficult thing. And to say, okay, you know, there's pros and cons on congestion pricing, and I certainly see them both. And as a city resident, you gotta you gotta hate it, you know. As a cab driver, as a anything, you know, but that area of Manhattan has long been a place now pretty much, you know, dominated by pretty high net worth people. So And city residents by all accounts are not the ones that are complaining. It's the people from, you know, Westchester, New Jersey. Uh, Long Island who are like, you know, the Republican House members out in Long Island are making a big sink of this. You know, Mike Lawler, the Republican in Westchester is making a big sink out of it. Bill Murphy is suing, I believe, the MTA to get to get rid of it. And, and I think it's just something that, you know, it needs to happen. Like New York is a city that is trying to be a global city. It's public transport is compared to any other city, you know, in America, it's it's top. But compared okay. to any other city in the world, you know, of that caliber, it's definitely the worst. So it's like it comes in terms of cleanliness, in terms of quality of the trains, in terms of just the service, frequency of the trains, all that stuff. Um, so I feel like, you know, it is a sign. And also it would be better than the environment. It'd be, you know, that rates a billion dollars, apparently, like according to uh, the calculations on this. And I think the best part of it is they would pay that. They also, uh, I think, factored in, attacks on new york city businesses mm-hmm. um i'm going to i believe that's what it was um uh, but yeah it does say here hokel has long been a major beneficiary of auto dealers um so which is is pretty important to highlight um many yeah so advocates auto auto this to give you an idea how this would hurt auto dealers they express apprehension about the consequences for dealerships as it was estimated to reduce the number of cars entering the central business district, excuse me, by 17%. In February, the Dealership Association of Greater New York wrote in an email to subscribers that, you know, this is not going to be good. Two months before the lobbying group submitted this comment, donated 18,000 to Hochul's campaign. Um, and they, another group gave her another 18,000, I think it was like a, a uh, New York State Automobile Dealers Association. Um, so just another one with a very similar name there, gave 18,000. And this goes back a long way. They've donated a total of $92,000 since 2018, including a $47,000 contribution in 2021. The Automobile Dealers of NY Political, Automobile Dealers of NY Political Action PAC committee has contributed almost $78,000 since 2018. So that's a little bit of the numbers there. Um, yeah. And this also this, this whole tax for the New York city, small businesses, I feel like is just a little bit of the icing on the cake. I mean, a hundred percent. I, I don't, I don't, I think the proponents of, congestion pricing will soon find that they may have lost this battle, but I don't think they're going to lose the war. I think it's going to happen. What do you think is the future here for this? Do you think they're going to be the, the backlash is going to be big enough to overturn this indefinite pause? You know, whatever that means. Oh yeah. 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 I think so. I think, I think so, but I, I don't have a crystal ball on this, but it just seems like there's so much momentum for this. Mm-hmm. Because the New York City grid is so tight, right? That it has to do something, right? Because supply and demand, you know, there's so much demand. So the only way you reduce demand is you got to increase price. There's so much demand to drive a car through the city, through those streets. Yeah. Yeah. So you have to increase price. Yeah. And it's just, however you do it, you're going to have to do it. Yeah. You know? And then, it, and it's not like you lose out, but just based on that price increase, you have, you know, you're able to maybe, you know, park your car at the train station if you're from the suburbs uh, in whatever direction, and you're able to much easier, easily, much more easily navigate around the city. And the MTA can come maybe twice per hour instead of once per hour 
uh, you know, for, for us here in the West. Like you, so you, you do get uh, some benefit of it. And that is why even, you know, for in London, like I would never, ever, ever want to drive there. Like in New York city, essentially the same way, even though I've driven there before, like, and they just have, you just don't need to. It's, it's something that is a very, I think it's a sign of a modern city. And I think the cor- corruption aspect of it and the, the really uh, just the direct quid pro quo of these groups putting in this money, even, you know, it's not eye watering sums, but you know, kind of local setting, it is a bigger deal is a great illustration. I hope this gets widely reported, although I know it probably won't. Uh, because it is a very great illustration of how the sausage gets made, and when I you have to admit enough people don't understand it. Enough when you have to admit that there's a balancing act, though, because a lot of the New York City workers who pay taxes in New York City come from Westchester, come from New Jersey, come from Connecticut. You know what do you mean? They how how do they pay they how do they pay taxes in New York City if they come from a place that's not well, New York City? If I if you buy some work in New York City, and you know I have to declare myself, if I work in New York City, yes, I could declare myself a New Jersey resident, and I would pay New Jersey tax. But I'm also buying lunch in New York City. I'm also stimulating the economy in New York City. Yeah, I I think that is the hope of the well. That is like you know part of it. That's going to be like the other side of it. But you do also have to say that they, I I would say I think it's pretty clear that they have factored that part in because of course they're going to invest it back into transit. The whole it's not just a big you know personal screw you to drivers. You know it is done with the explicit aim of making the transit system better both within the city and commuter rail wise. So I think you know it may not be it'll take obviously a few years to kick in, but. In the much longer term, you know, as time continues, like there has been, you know, I think you look at London, it's very, very popular, especially, you know, within the, the closer you get to the center of the city. Um, but I think, it, I, I think it will set up and do pretty uh, well. $30,000 seems cheap to buy a governor's vote, you know, but maybe there's something else. Well, I think if you look at, with, but I think if you look at the, I think, a, uh, Long time donor, you know, I think it's, it's not just the 36,000 over the, the Q2. It's, I think it's over a longer period of time. A long time donor talking to you as a friend with the threat of money behind it. I would say, I would say it's enough. You know, I would say it's definitely enough. Um, and yeah, I feel like, awesome. you know, in terms of that would probably go a long way into funding her, you know, her next campaign. Um, because again, it's not like she's going to run, uh, even probably like a one to two million dollar campaign because she's not really going to have to run that much against well she did have to get running against a republican last time so pretty hard so i may take my take my words back there uh but it is a very interesting connection there i'll I be interested to hear a more a more expert opinion on that by comparison what do you suppose you got paid for green lighting the stadium in buffalo what is she? Oh, yeah, that's that would be very interesting to know because that's a, a an owner who can really put in, you know, right, that's a, few, a million turf, right, right away. That is also her home turf. And talk about, you know, a longer, more deeply financially rooted re- relationship. I'm sure she has with isn't it? It's, it's a family that owns the bills, right? I forget their names. Uh, Yes. The uh, it's oh, I'm forgetting. Nelson, but, Nelson, something like that. But yeah, she put a lot of more taxpayer money on the line to support that than we're ever going to get from congested price. That that is something that is very very clear, and it's also something that is a big problem that I think pretty much could get disagreement throughout the throughout the way. And you know, I saw it was voted down pretty outstandingly in Oakland and in Kansas City, actually. Uh, they literally had like Travis Kelsey vo- cutting ads saying vote to give us money to build a stadium or not even him money, but you know, the owner's money. And right. it turned, it turned away pretty bad. Like Travis Kelsey and Patrick Mahomes in an ad together was not enough to get that through, which was uh, pretty remarkable and shows that people are not big fans of that policy, which is very, very fair. 
I mean, relatively speaking, I think congestion pricing is interesting, but not her biggest buy off. But you know, yeah, I'm like, not sure just what it appears. I I feel like it is her most consequential. It may not be her biggest numerical buy off, but I think it is right. her most consequential buy off because I think it really would over especially over 10 20 years make such an improvement to the MTA and also it would be a way that is not even you know you can't it's much harder to take that out to cut that budget because the money is already set it's so easily paid for and once it sets in for a few years it's going to be so hard to take away but now you know who knows when it will set in true true stuff right. yeah yeah an open question as to whether it will eventually come to pass or not. No, I agree. Yeah, that's going to be very interesting to follow. I'm sure her office is busy with a lot of different people there. And, you know, it, it's going to be interesting to see who she listens to. Uh, just a collection of Long Island car dealers who have paid her $100,000 over the years or uh, the the heads and the, the leaders of the M MTA, who I'm sure are pretty, pretty furious right about now. All right, this is all we got for you guys today. We will be back on Friday. Thank you so much. It's News Flash.